We have dealt with the plasticity and we are trying to understand the plastic deformation in materials. And we have got introduced to two terms like slip planes and slip directions, which, can't, which together makes a slip system. So what we have looked at was we have an undeformed sample and when we apply a shear stress, this gets deformed using the slip mechanism and that occurs on a certain crystallographic plane, I call it as slip plane and along a certain crystallographic direction, I call it as a slip direction. So let me mark over here, yeah, I have a slip plane is this on which the slip is occurring and this is the direction along which the slip is occurring. So this is a direction and this is a slip plane. So together contributes a slip system. So we have seen a slip system for FCC, BCC and HCP uh, structures. And now we will be looking at what is the amount of stress that is required to cause this slip. So let's investigate this problem of finding out what is the stress needed to have slip to occur in a crystallographic materials. So let's consider a single crystal over here which has which is being subject to a tensile stress sigma and this sigma is applied along its tensile axis as shown over here. And let us consider the cross section area of this sample to be A and let us mark a slip plane here as shown which has a cross section area AS and let us define this slip plane using a slip normal, slip plane normal to be N which makes an angle of phi with respect to our tensile axis and let us mark a slip direction as D which makes an angle of lambda with respect to our tensile axis. So this is a slip plane having area AS and slip normal N and slip direction to be T and the angle which they are making the slip normal is making phi angle phi with the tensile axis while slip direction is making angle lambda with a tensile axis. So this is how we define our slip system here and let's say I have a, this stress which is being applied. Now our aim is to find out what is a stress that is required to cause slip on this plane. That is our aim. So we have to find out a stress with respect to the applied stress that is a tensile stress and let's do that. So first thing which we do is like find out a tensile force acting on area A. Let's find out the force F acting on this area A and that is given as F is equal to sigma A. Now we know that slip occurs on the, along a the slip direction. So let's find out a force which is acting along the slip direction. So to find, to find out that you have to find out a component of F along slip direction. So Fd is equal to F cos lambda. So it makes an angle lambda this with slip direction. Uh, the tensile force is making an angle lambda with slip direction. So I can write it as Fd is equal to F cos lambda. Now we have to find out a shear stress which causes slip to occur. So I call it as a resolved shear stress acting on a slip plane which acts on the slip plane along slip direction. So you can find it out by dividing the area of this slip plane. So let's do that. I call it as this resolved shear stress as to be tau RSS and it will be give, it will be given as Fd upon As. Now I put this value here of Fd which is nothing but F cos lambda and I get tau RSS to be F cos lambda upon As. Now you can also find out As in terms of A which is given as A upon cos phi. So this plane that is a slip plane and the normal of to this slip plane is n which is making an angle phi with respect to tensile axis and using this geometry you can find it out that as must be equal to a upon cos phi. Now if I put this value of as in this relation you can say that tau rss to be equal to f cos lambda into cos phi 
upon a so if you look at this relation i can replace this f upon a by sigma using this relation and let us do that so we get tau rss that is resolved shear stress acting along a slip direction on a slip plane equal to sigma cos lambda into cos phi so this is a relation this simple but very important relation by this relation you can relate the tau rss that is a resolved shear stress acting on any slip plane with applied stress normal stress that is sigma and if you know the angle lambda and phi which are the angle this slip system is making with the tensile axis so this relation we can use it to find out what is a resolved shear stress on a any given plane now let's move on on and see the implications of this relation so we have this relation where i replace this cos lambda into cos phi as m and this is called as a schmidt factor so there are two special con conditions or situations which i would like to discuss so let's consider a single crystal here and the tensile axis is marked and let's consider this slip plane to be perpendicular to tensile axis now in this case if i see a d which is a slip direction you can clearly see that lambda will be equal to 90 degree which is nothing but an angle between a tensile axis and the slip direction so it comes out to be 90 and if i use this relation what the value of tau rss you get is equal to 0 now similarly you have another situation where your slip plane is parallel to tensile axis so this is one extreme where the slip plane is perpendicular to tensile axis and this is another extreme where the slip plane is parallel to tensile axis and in this case if you draw a slip normal a slip plane normal and you can say that phi equal to 90 degrees and the tau rss comes out to be equal to 0 so we can say clearly that for these two extreme cases where slip plane is perpendicular to tensile axis and slip plane is parallel to tensile axis that there will be no shear stresses on these two planes now let's look at this relation in more detail way so i have tau rss equal to sigma cos lambda into cos phi and let's plot tau rss versus sigma So as you see that it is a, a it it is a giving a straight line where cos phi cos lambda which is a Schmidt factor m will be a slope of this line. Now as I increase the stress, the tau RSS is increasing, and there will be a stage which will come when sigma that is an applied stress along a tensile axis reaches a yield strength of a material so let me mark that point over here on the sigma axis as sigma y now corresponding there will be a resolved shear stress on a slip plane so let's mark that point and this point is very crucial which is determining the slip slip phenomena which is occurring on the slip plane so this point is called as tau crss or the shear stress which reaches on a slip plane corresponding to yield stress of a material is called as critical resolved shear stress what let me explain it to a, to you again when material starts yielding there will be a stress or a resolved shear stress which will reach on a slip plane which will ultimately cause slip to occur and that critical value of resolved shear stress is called as tau crss in mathematical way i can say that as sigma approaches sigma y tau rss is reaching towards tau crss so what is tau crss 
is the value of RSS at the point of yielding and is called as critical to resolve shear stress. So this law which was relating tau RSS with sigma and with this angle is called as Schmidt's law. And let us look at this in more detail. We can change the Schmidt factor. So if you see mathematically, we can change it by changing the orientation of tensile axis. So you can change this factor which is cos phi and cos lambda. So if we have this relation tau CRSS equal to sigma y cos phi into cos lambda, look at this relation carefully. So when sigma has reached a value of sigma y that is yield stress, I write this tau as to be tau CRSS. This is a very important point to note. So here mathematically if you look at this relation, we can change this factor cos phi and cos lambda by changing the orientation of tensile axis. Now at yielding this equality must be satisfied. So you have three questions now. So when I can change this, so sigma y changes and tau CRSS remains constant. Or the second point maybe tau CRSS is changing and sigma y remains constant. Or both sigma y and tau CRSS is changing. So these are the three situations or three questions uh, which we can get from this relation. So which one is changing? That is what we want to find out when, when we can change this cos phi and cos lambda. Which one is changing? Whether sigma y is changing or tau CRS is changing or, or both are changing. Professor Eric Smith based on his experiments or observations, this is called as a Schmidt law and he did very careful experiments and have seen that for a magnesium single crystal and he plotted tensile stress versus the Schmidt factor which is cos phi cos lambda and he has seen that the tensile stress which is nothing but a yield stress is changing is changing with respect to cos phi and cos lambda and he proposed with very meticulous experiments that this value that is a critical result shear stress is independent of the orientation of stress axis with respect to the slip system. That means the critical result shear stress doesn't change, it remains constant. The first option that is sigma y changes and tau CRS remains constant is to be true, it is true. So sigma y changes and tau CRSS remains constant. This is a Schmidt law. So you have seen that you can compare it now with anisotropy of single crystal that if I have changed the orientation, its yield strength changes. So this, this is comes as an anisotropy of a single crystal. However, the tau CRSS that is a critical result shear stress which causes sleep to occur on a sleep plane along a particular sleep direction that remains constant even if this cos phi and cos lambda is changing or a Schmidt factor is changing that is what is shown from this figure. So here you can see clearly that the tensile stress is lowest at the highest Schmidt factor that is 0.5. Note this cos phi cos lambda values as varying from 0 to 0 and the highest is at the center of this. So here you see that you get lowest value of tensile stress at the highest value of Schmidt factor and that will occur only when that theta or here it is phi and lambda are to be 45 45. So which makes the highest Schmidt factor to come out to be 0.5 because cos of 45 will be 1 upon root 2 and here if I put 1 upon root 2 into 1 upon root 2 it becomes 1 by 2 nothing but 0.5. So you will have the lowest value of tensile stress or the material will yield at or yield at the lowest value of stress and this point is called as a soft orientation while if I orient my crystal in a way where the slip systems 
shows a lower value of Schmidt factor, those are called as hard orientations. So let me write it down. So this part, these are these are hard orientations. Similarly, these are hard orientations. That means material show higher value of tensile stress or yield stress when they are oriented such a way that the Schmidt factor is lower. So here the point to be taken is that material will show a lower yield value or yield stress for Schmidt factor which is a higher. So we can write it in a sentence that plastic deformation start on a slip system with the highest Schmidt factor. We have seen the different slip systems in material. So for a slip system where the Schmidt factor reaches the highest or is the highest will have plastic deformation will begin on that kind of a slip system. Now let's understand this by taking an example. Now let's consider this example where determine the tensile stress that is applied along the 1 1 bar 0 axis to a silver crystal to cause slip on the 1 1 bar 1 bar 0 1 bar 1 system the critical result shear stress is 6 MPa. Let's read this question again or try to understand. So we have to find out a tensile stress that is applied along. So you have given a axis tensile axis along 1 bar 1 0 for a sing silver crystal. So the silver crystal is FCC. So this is what an information you have to see and the slip occurs on 1, 1 bar 1 bar that is this plane and this is a direction, this is a slip direction. The critical result shear stress is given as 6 MPa. Let's understand this. So this tensile axis we have been given as 1, 1 bar 0 and you have given the slip plane which is like 1 bar 1, 1 bar 1 bar and this is a cubic system so you can clearly say that the normal must be for the slip direction here is 0 bar 1, 0 1 bar 1 and this plane normal must be uh, 1, 1 bar 1 bar. So you can write it this for a cubic system. So we know what are the slip plane normal, slip direction and a tensile axis. Now you can find out a angle that is a cos theta which, which you can see that if I want to find out the cos phi between slip plane normal and tensile axis we have to use we can use this formula for a cubic systems and let's do that. So cos phi will be an angle between slip plane normal and a tensile axis and you plug in these values here and you get cos phi equal to 2 upon root 6. Similarly, you can find out the angle between tensile axis and the slip direction that is this tensile axis and a slip direction. Cos phi comes out to be 1 upon 2. Now we have been given the resolved shear stress to be 6 MPa and from that what we have to find out what determine the tensile stress that is applied. So we have to find out a sigma which has to be applied. So we have been given tau r and I have to find out a sigma so which I write it as p upon a which is nothing but a force upon area and this relation we have already seen. So I get tau r upon cos phi cos lambda is, is equal to sigma. The value of tau r that is resolved shear stress to be given as 6. We have figured it out cos phi to be 2 upon root 6 and cos lambda to be 1 upon 2 and you get a value of 14.7 MPa. If I know what is a resolved shear stress that is to be needed to have a slip to occur, we can figure it out what can be a stress that is required along this tensile axis to cause this slip to occur or we can do vice versa. If we know, we know the stress, we can find out what is a tau RSS which is there on this slip plane. Now let's Let's consider this example to understand Schmidt law or operative slip systems in more detail. A single crystal of a copper is deformed in tension 
and the loading axis is 112. Calculate the Schmidt factors for the different slip systems. If the critical result shear stress is 50 MPa, what is the tensile stress at which the material will start to deform plastically? So let's read this and understand this question again. A single crystal of copper is deformed in a tension. The loading axis is 112. So we have given a loading axis. Calculate the Schmidt factors for a different slip systems. Now what are different slip systems? We have to answer this. If the critical result shear stress is 50 MPa, what is the stress at which the material will start to deform plastically? Now this is a copper, so you have an FCC crystal structure and which has copper is FCC and the number of slip systems are 111 that is a slip plane and this is the slip direction. This we have already seen. So these are there are 12 slip systems. Now the question is which slip system will be operative? We have to find out and we have seen that the slip system which will be operative where the Schmidt factor is highest. Let's do that. Let's do calculate all the slip systems. So we have slip plane that is 111 and there are three slip directions which we have already looked at. For one plane, one slip plane will have three directions. So there are four such kind of slip planes and there are three directions on each slip plane which makes to be 12 number of slip systems will be 12. So here are 3, 3, 3 and 3 it becomes 12. So I have a slip plane 111, I have a slip direction which is bar 110 and you can find out a cos phi. So that you can use this relation that the loading axis is given as 112. So here the cos phi comes out to be 2 root 2 upon 3 and cos lambda to be 0 and Schmidt factor comes out to be 0. This is an extreme case where this we have seen that cos lambda is equal to 0 so there will not be any shear stress and thus the there will not be any sleep occurring. So it is not deformed. Similarly you can consider this case where this plane that is 1 bar 1 1 and this direction to be 0 1 bar 1 you can see the cos phi comes out to be root 2 upon 3 cos lambda to be root 3 upon 6 and Schmidt factor comes out to be root 6 upon 18 and it, it gives me a stress to be 367. So this is one case and this is another case where our 1 bar 1 1 and 1 0 1 it is like I get a cos phi is to be root 2 upon 3, cos lambda to be root 3 upon 2 and Schmidt factor is root 6 upon 6 which comes out to be 122. So you can see that these are the planes or these are the slip systems where you see a maximum Schmidt factor. You can see clearly here root 6 upon 6 will give you a maximum Schmidt factor. And thus, you don't need a much of stress to cause yielding or cause a slip on these planes. These planes or this slip system will be operative. This will start operating first. They will, the slip will start occurring on this kind of planes. So these are called as a primary slip system. The stress required to cause slip on the primary slip system is the yield stress of the single crystal. And that is what is being defined. Now if you see that this was the highest Schmidt factor and the second highest was are these, these slip systems which are marked by a blue color. So this slip system will start operating after this primary slip systems and these are called as secondary slip system. So as this slip system will start when the load is increased further and then tau RSS may be reached on other slip systems and this will start operating and these are called as secondary slip system. From this slide what we can say that there are primary slip system and there are secondary slip system. So let me explain it to you again what exactly the importance of a Schmidt factor. 
so let's say I have this single crystal which we have seen okay and uh, it is being deformed and I have I have different I have different slip planes okay so I have planes like this and other crystallographic planes maybe let me put it with another color so let's say the blue one has highest Schmidt factor that is M is highest than the green one let me call it as M2 and let me call it as M1 so M1 is greater than M2 so what will happen you will have slip to occur on these planes first which are blue planes because the Schmidt factor is highest here and for green it will start once we increase the stress to a certain level where the tau RSS will also reach on these planes which are green planes which has lowest Schmidt factor as compared to blues planes which has highest Schmidt factor. So slip will start occurring on the slip planes and then if we further increase load or stress the slip will start operating on or slip will start occurring on these planes. So the blue ones will be a primary slip system which has the highest Schmidt factor whereas the green ones are the secondary slip system which has the lowest Schmidt factor and with this example we have figured it out what are primary slip systems and secondary slip system. So when we talk about slip what we are doing is you have a single crystal it is represented over here so when I try to put this single crystal under a tensile load or force it will cause slip to occur on a plane or a slip system where the Schmidt factor is the highest. When the ends are not constrained so when these are free to move what will happen that slip will start occurring on these planes where the Schmidt factors are highest. So it will deform in this way. When you see a tensile test these ends are not free to move. So here in this case you can see that the specimen is not or it is not allowed to deform freely and that's what occurs in a, a typical tensile test. So the slip planes will try to rotate towards the tensile axis as because the tensile axis remains fixed or constrained. So we can see that which are the slip systems that are that can get operative during tensile deformation and that we can understood using a stereographic projection. So this stereographic projection is not for an exam. So those who are interested I would like to take an extra class to see which are the primary slip systems or secondary slip systems and how to identify slip system as we move along or as we go on increasing the deformation. Now let me tell you something about uh, current research in this area. So we have seen here as a single crystal. So forming those single crystal, big single crystal become difficult sometimes. So we can use an EBSD plot where we know the orientation of each grain and if you have sufficiently long grains and sufficiently more area what we can do is that each grain is representing a single crystal and then I can use this FIP technique and make out some pillars like this which are very small in size you can see like these are two microns and this is a pillar before deformation and I put a small indenter on this surface and try to deform. So here you can see this, this single crystal is being deformed. You can see the slip is occurring on certain crystallographic planes and these are the slip lines which we can see it or here. Let me play a video for you. It's from Professor Greer's lab. So here you can see that material is deforming. Okay, or We are compressing a pillar here again I'm repeating it so here you can see we are deforming a material and you can see a formation of slip planes or slip is occurring on these planes clearly 
So this is a current research which is going into understanding the deformation behavior of each individual grains using such kind of advanced techniques. So with this, I will stop here.